Hey folks, welcome to this week's What's Your Baseline Shorts. I'm Jay Amaronson, Frost and Architecture Expert, and I'm excited to be joined with, with me with Roland Volz, um, who is going to tell us a little bit more about simulation today. Roland, why don't you introduce yourself first, and then we'll tackle today's topic, simulation. Sure. Hi, I'm Roland. I'm the guy <laughs> who had the idea for all those shenanigans, uh, and obviously you can look at my bio if you want to see more details on that. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, then let's talk about today's topic, because this is really What's Your Baseline Shorts, the shortened version of our, our hour-long podcast you can find on whatsyourbaseline.com. But today we're talking about simulation. Now, it's a question a lot of people have for us. How do I do something with the information from my process? And Roland, let's tell them more about what that means from a simulation perspective. Oh, well, um, I think simulation is more the idea of that you can create futures, plural, mm -hmm. in your tools and simulate, quote unquote, what would be the outcome. Or to say it in other words, you have a process mm -hmm. and you change parameters on it and then you see what the different outcomes will be with the idea that you will then pick, obviously, the most advantageous. And yeah. you use that for your implementation. Well, it's also, there's an, another another element of simulation that I really find important, which is future-proofing. So, yeah, so simulation is very good at creating those what-if scenarios. So a bunch of like, how, what if I change this thing? What would be my mm -hmm. business value? So as you might imagine, that's used a lot for things like project justification. Say like, oh, if I just, if I were to only change these three things at the cost of a total cost of two million, I could save us a million dollars a year, like a huge amount of value, right? Um, but the other thing is that I've got a process today that's run, you know, 5,000 times a week. What if tomorrow this became a core process for the company and it was run 25,000 times a week or 100,000 mm -hmm. times a week or mm -hmm. a million times a week? Where would it break first? And so simulation can also be used to future proof processes. Um, so I feel, I feel like that's a really important thing that, that people often overlook when they're first thinking about the use case for simulation. But man, I, got, I have clients who are leveraging that today to do a lot of really good things. And, and you open a kind of warm with that because simulation <laughs> in itself is obviously not, well, it is a thing, but it's not a standalone thing. So no. typically it's embedded in, in what I like to call the solution life cycle, right? right. Where you have some high level analysis and, and you might use simulation there as you described, you know, what happens if we go 20,000 times a day, right? Uh, or you go to the next step where you say, oh yeah, I'm designing a future state for Whatever, a system implementation for a reorg, you know, yeah. for a process improvement, right? And you want to figure out what's the most advantageous there. And then it goes through implementation and the execution. And then some vendors say, hey, we're going to have that in our process mining tool, which is the measure phase. And yeah. we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, JM, tell me a little bit about what does a simulation do or what do you have to put in to get a meaningful simulation outcome? That's a really good question. And I mean, there's kind of a minimum viable product, right? You need to have a demand model. So how much are you asking? You need to have mm -hmm. a process model, which is how does it work? And you need to have some factor of time and flow to help you to understand how long each step takes. And that could be formulas. So you could have like a normal curve with you know the, the, the parameters defined about each step. Or you can simply mm -hmm. have flat numbers like average times. And then you need to have routing numbers as in what percentage of time does it go down path A versus path B so that I can see how often it ends up in my different flow scenarios. And so demand, time, and routing. That's really the so basic level. That, I think there's a fourth one that you should put in, which is resources. Typically, human resources, yeah. right? How many people do this? <laughs> I, I hope you um, do. It's a, but you, don't, you don't have well, to, but it, be, it does a lot of good for you if you do. <laughs> good, good simulation tools allow you to uh, simulate machines. Yeah. Right. Just think about some IoT thing or think, think about oh, yeah. a manufacturing line, you know, where obviously we changing the jig in the machine for the different next piece that you want to do is obviously also time consuming, you know, oh, it's yeah. the dynamic wait time and all these type of things. Well, if you want but, to get really down into it, you can even do things like simulating um, physical resources. So I can have like a yeah. hopper with a certain number of widgets in it, and then it can track how often this process draws down on the hopper and how often replenishment comes to fill up my hopper again. And so you mm -hmm. can see like, like those, those resources are what we use very heavily to find bottlenecks. 
um, because mm -hmm. oftentimes that's where you're going to find the most the most opportunity for improvement in terms of uh, rebalancing loads and you know taking a look at future proofing uh, you know what demand will require in terms of resources on your side because for instance if you're looking at a team of like 20 people you got them in five different roles we don't have four people in each role what you actually have is like two people in this role and six people in that role and seven people in this role and one person in this role if you switch around the resources, you could you could load balance the work that's being done much better. Mm -hmm. Or if you switch around which resource is doing which task, you can much better adapt for who you have to be able to make sure your process works better. So resourcing is a great way of understanding bottlenecks, and then it gives you a really good way of helping to optimize around who you have. So what is the outcome then of the simulation? Is well, it just a, a, a yeah. picture or, or what do you get? You know, so you, you put ideally, all that effort in there. Yeah. I, ideally, there's there's uh, a few different outcomes of simulation. Um, the, ideally, a simulation is going to tell you uh, or suggest to you possible paths for success based off your criteria. So a, a perfect example How? is, is that is, 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 is a little person... Is yeah. that little person in there that, that whispers in your yeah. ear and no, says, no, no. JM, you should do this? Video. Or how, yeah, yeah. What do you have? There's a few, a few things. So, so what, number one is a lot of good simulation tools will write onto your process steps um, different numbers um, about how they performed under the simulated conditions. Um, you can use that to throw up dashboards to understand and highlight where bottlenecks are, um, where issues are coming up in your process, where things are needy or greedy process steps. So you can say, okay, so I'm going to highlight the things in like a, in a bar chart. These three mm -hmm. things are my biggest problems. If I were to change three things in this process, I suspect these would have the highest impact. The other mm -hmm. thing simulation can kick out for you is statistical files, things like um, Excel files with a bunch of scenarios laid out and even scored scenarios. So we take a look at like optimization. You can score the combination of parameters that you can control to say this one has the highest net value to me. Um, and so we, we have like a weighting system on like each different parameter, like how much do I care about how long people are waiting versus how much do I care about how much money I'm spending on human resources? Like those are things you can weigh against each other. And that's, a, you can kick out an Excel file or some tools have an in-tool analysis mm -hmm. for that. They often have a visualization that you can watch sort of simulate through and even step through to see, okay, so I have a problem here. It's an outlier condition what happened and let me watch back to be able to understand how I have to adapt. So that sounds super geeky to me, which is, <laughs> which is one thing it that we're going to talk about when, when we talk about the different ways of doing this, but I yeah. want to push that a little bit out for a minute or so. But I think the takeaway, the first takeaway is um, you as the potential simulation user mm -hmm. should have a hypothesis. You know, you should know what you're looking for. Are you interested in, um, bottlenecks. How yeah. are your bottlenecks being defined? Is it just the step that takes too long? Or is it the step that builds up a backlog and therefore it's too long because you uh, bind resources for this? Right. So, or are you looking for the utilization, the, the age old question, how many people do I need to do this job? You yeah. know, so come up with an idea what your problem is that you're looking at. Right, so that, you can do, that's the first takeaway. Even without even without necessarily having a hypothesis, one of the things we haven't talked about a little bit yet is cost. Um, a lot of organizations mm -hmm. are trying to to drive towards minimum of cost. So it's not actually just a hypothesis. It's also like a goal in mind. Like, what are you trying to get? To? Yeah, how, where where can I save? You know, exactly. Or, so so you know all the. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get a, a savings model, and I actually did this with a really a major technology company in the Southwest. Um, they said I we we, we have an external system um, that we're using that is uh, owned by a third party. And every time we use it, um, we use that system, it costs us money. Um, how do mm -hmm. we make sure that we use it only when necessary? So how do I have yeah. to reallocate resources? How can I re-engineer my process, change around the steps that I'm actually doing so that we hit the system less with the same number of people? And so cost was a huge factor. So you have to include cost of steps. So how much does a thing cost if it's an mm -hmm. external step? Or how much do our resources cost and then how long are those resources taking? So we can do a human resource cost. How much do our internal resources um, or our internal like services cost? Um, so if you're looking at a chargeback or a showback scenario with one of your other business units or IT who's providing the service to you. Um, and mm -hmm. we can we can do a, a pretty detailed analysis on where those costs are coming from and then be able to minimize around that. That could be, a, instead of a hypothesis, that could be a, kind of a goal. Makes sense. Even though I would would put it in the same bucket, you know, yeah. figure out what you want to know. Yeah. yeah. The, the second, the, I think the second takeaway that you have is, um, you can take that 
output, right? So yeah. the M said you got bar charts and pie charts and all that type of stuff. You obviously could export it. And I'm pretty sure if you have some lean person in your organization, they will be your best buddies oh, yeah. because then they can use this for their additional statistical analysis that uh, is a little bit over the head for me and models yeah. like myself. Well, yeah, like, um, like I know things like MATLAB are really good for plotting yeah, statistical yeah, yeah. curves, and like you can really get down. If this, for, first and if foremost, if you go down the whole Six Sigma <laughs> rabbit hole, yes, yes, the statisticians out there, we love you. No, no disrespect, but on this podcast, we're we're saying a little bit less complicated than what you're doing. Um, but thank you for doing what you do. <laughs> so the the third takeaway, the third takeaway, and this is yeah. what I pushed out a minute ago, is well, you need to understand what type of simulation you have. Mm -hmm. And what I see is typically three types, right? So the first type is what's called discrete event simulation. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, I would say, brute forcing the simulation engine to do things. So if you say you have a process and it runs 300 times a day um, and it has whatever, so many resources and so many steps and each step takes so long. And when you come to a branch, 80% go this way, 20% go this way, this type of stuff. It right. literally creates 300 instances. Mm -hmm. And it runs those 300 instances, obviously much faster than uh, a human would do this, right? And it goes through and then creates those statistics while uh, observing those parameters mm -hmm. that we have, right? This gives you the tightest control, Right, because you can trace down each individual instance. You yeah. can say, oh yeah, this is how this instance went and the other one went a different path, right? Similar to what you see in process mining. And this is really um, handy when you have um, the statistical distribution of things on each step. So if I have a normal that's curve different. on this step. That's right. different, that's different. That's the second takeaway. Right. That's the Monte Carlo simulation, right? Where you go and you have probabilities and you throw individual samples on it. And if you do that, Often enough, you obviously have the biggest enough population to come to a similar, um, a similar result. Well, Monte but Carlo it's, also it's relies on varying parameters. Like Monte Carlo, you would you wouldn't run the same simulation exactly as is with the, even with the statistical things. You would also change the numbers in it each time you, you run do. it. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, so, you do. so what discrete event simulation will give you is sort of how the process performed in all of its different ways it could have gone. Monte Carlo will say all of the different ways it could have gone multiplied by all the different configurations of the process yep. equals all this, this huge chart of possibility. And that's when we do the, the scoring as a Monte Carlo style simulation is when we go, okay, what, what combination of parameters led to the best outcomes? Which means it's faster because it's just math and computers are good in math. Yes, they right? are. So, but you have less, less control, if you will. It's not the brute force attempt. The yeah. third one is... And and this is, I actually, the, the whole beef that you and I have about this topic is when you see tool vendors um, yes. that, that say, oh, we have simulation in, in our tool. The, right? meat, and, the meat of this conversation is, yes, is at, tool, particularly, 12 minutes, 12 minutes 44. It's particularly <laughs> vendors in process mining. They will tell yeah, you so, they have simulation. Yeah. And I think that the problem with that is, so what they do is, and, and I like to say it, and don't want to diss on anyone there, sure. you know, call it whatever you want, but it's more like a glorified what if, because um, in process mining, everything is based on the data set that yeah. you pulled, right, from your runtime systems, which is basically your as is information. So what you can do now is in these simulations is you can play with parameters. What happens if we had twice as many or these type of things, right? Mm -hmm. But it's always based on the data set. So what you're missing, when we think about the solution lifecycle that I just described before, what happens if you want to throw out your whole process and do something completely different as part of your solution design? You can't. You're screwed. Right? And that is, I think, that the biggest thing, that I, the biggest beef that I have with process mining uh, where people say, oh, yeah, we have our simulation in the process mining tool. Yeah, and the process so, mining can inform the steps oh, yeah. of, your, of your process for simulation. That's a good thing, having process yeah. mining as a data source. But process mining isn't the workplace. It's the data That's source. True. And when you start That's to true. take that, that, have that mental shift of like, I can do everything in this one space, like you can... But you are limited, extremely limited on the choices you can make. We had a, somebody, a colleague we used to work with um, who used to say, if I only have, or if it takes me a lot of work to do something, I only present one or two choices. But when I present five or six choices because I've got a lot more flexibility because of the tool I've chosen, I'm more likely to come to a better solution. So let's so, come to the end of, yes. of this wonderful, what's your baseline choice? What were the takeaways? Number one, 
Jim, come on. Number, no, one. number one is that um, simulation is something that you should be looking at from a, three different perspectives, parameter variation, from flow variation, and from optimization of conditions. Mm -hmm. Number two would be have an idea what you're looking for, right? Yep. Just don't start out in the blue. And number three, JM, is what? Is that your process mining tools are not your simulation tools. They're a good feeder, but they are not a replacement. And yeah, so, ladies and gentlemen, so nicely said. <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure as always. I'm JM Erlinson. And I'm Roland Volt. And we will see you. And we're going to see one. you in the next one. <laughs>